If you're catastrophically anticipating how this interaction is going to go, instead of catastrophically anticipating, anticipate how your response is going to be different. And you can let yourself have a little fun with that. So the person comes in and says the critical thing like, oh, I see you still haven't changed your hairstyle. Instead of thinking that you have to then come back or instead of going inside and stewing and saying, God, they always say that. Why are they like that? Why questions are not helpful in this situation, by the way. Why are they like that? Why do they always do that? Forget about those why questions. Not helpful. Welcome to season six of Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and all the big feelings too. We tackle the serious stuff without being too serious. And I'm your co-host, Robin. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author. And I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. I'll give you concrete steps to take and the words to say. Okay, Lynn, so we are entering the holiday season and other podcasts <laughs> might talk about great gifts. But here's the funny thing about us. We're going to help you talk about the horrible nightmare relatives <laughs> that you're about to face that you avoid all year until Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever holiday you celebrate. Right. Not even just the horrible nightmare relatives that you only see over the holidays, but how about just like the people that are in your life? that just do the things they always do, except they feel different at the holidays. We jack up the holidays as this time of year in which everything has to be perfect. And then when people do their normal stuff at the holidays, people see the behavior differently or they respond to it in a way that's different when the person is always doing that stuff. That's exactly right. These are skills that you're going to teach us that are relevant for really any difficult person in your life. Yes. That gets a rise out of you, gets a bad reaction hurts your feelings, all of these things. Yeah. It's just that during the holiday season, it seems like the stakes are always higher. There's so much planning and so much anticipation and so much detail and just cranks it up, which is probably the same thing that happens with all big events. Like it's probably the same at a wedding. If this is a wedding podcast, we'd talk about how this happens at weddings or how it happens at graduations or whatever. Anytime when the social pressure is high and the social requirements are high, then all these behaviors get ramped up in a different way. That's very interesting when you think about the fact that there is a cultural acceptance, especially for mothers, that the holidays are a very stressful period because we feel stretched so thinly. But what if, in fact, it really isn't about the shopping list? What if the reason why you're actually really stressed is because you're distracting yourself with your shopping list? because you don't want to face the feelings that you have about some of the encounters that you know are inevitable. And that's a good way to put it, is that there are going to be encounters with people that are inevitable because they're always inevitable. And now they're just going to be inevitable at the holidays. <laughs> right. <laughs> Same thing. All right. So should we dive into the first of these patterns or the first of these problems that I want people to pay attention to? Absolutely. The first one, which will be familiar to you that listen, everybody. Hi, get ready. Here it comes. Catastrophic anticipation. There is so much storytelling that goes on as you are anticipating something. And remember, this is what anxiety is, right? It's like telling that story, that movie that, oh God, it's going to end catastrophically. And as you are planning your visit with your cousin coming in, or people are going to be house guests this catastrophic anticipation reaches a new level. So you start anticipating what's going to happen. And it goes so far, and many of you can probably relate to this, is that you play out the conversations in your head. When they say this, I'm going to say this, and then they're going to say this, and I'm going to say this, or I'm going to do this thing, and I know my cousin is going to say this, or blah, blah, blah. All of that is laying down pathways in your brain, just putting yourself through something that's not actually happening. And that's what worry is. It's creating a story. It's creating a movie that's not actually happening. What if you have had bad interactions, though, a history of interactions with a relative, and what comes up is all the pain, all those different times they really hurt your feelings. It's a montage, a slightly different story, because it's about the pain you've experienced instead of the anticipatory dread of what is yet to come. 
Right. So it can be a good combination of the stuff that's already happened, which gives your anticipation credibility. If you've had delightful interactions with your aunt or your grandmother or your stepsister, if you've had delightful interactions, you are not going to do catastrophic anticipating about that person. You actually might do the opposite. You might think, oh my gosh, every time I see Aunt Tootie, I always feel so good about myself. It's the people that you already know have the power to wound you, have the power to sort of go after that thing about you that you already might feel a little shame about. If you have an interaction with somebody that you don't know and they say something about you and you're in the store at the grocery line, geez, dude, right? Like, What's his problem? Yeah, yeah. Like get over yourself. But you don't then tell a catastrophic story about what would happen if you ran into somebody who insulted your shoes at the grocery store. Generally on the holidays, you're hanging out with people that you have a history with, that they know your vulnerabilities, they know how to get you, and you're anticipating. And there are people who you know are going to say certain things. And so you start practicing and you start thinking about what they're going to say and what you're going to say. And then, boy, you're just watching the movie called Bad Thanksgiving Dinner. Right, right. We did an episode sometime this year on boundaries, and we had a lot of examples about what boundaries really were and what they weren't. And I learned a lot, and the takeaway from that episode also is you do know people. What are you going to do with that information? On a meta level, we're talking about like, you know, you're about to have an encounter with someone who has hurt you in the past. What are the skills that are reasonable to develop to withstand that? Because some people listening might have this person in their heads where the behavior is annoying. Other people, the behavior in the past could have been a lot trickier and a lot more painful, but I bet the skills are the same in a way. So one of the big skills when you're dealing with somebody who has the capacity to wound you, to hurt you, and it's from maybe a long history of interactions with them, is that one of the things that we don't do, and I think is really helpful to do, maybe that person you say, God, they always say the same thing. They always do the same thing, right? I could just count on this person being this and this and this and this. Think about how you are different than you were then. So one of the skills is to let you evolve to give you the opportunity to have a different response rather than thinking that their old pattern and your old pattern are going to play themselves out in the same way. You might just spend a moment or two thinking about how am I different than I was when I was 24 or when I was 13? How have I evolved? How am I going to respond differently to that comment in a way that I wouldn't have been able to do when I was little or a way that I wouldn't have been able to do when I was a teenager. And if you are going to tell a story, if you are going to rehearse something, rehearse the way that you're going to be different. Don't hope that they're going to be different. Rehearse the way that you're going to be different. I love that. That was actually part of the takeaway for me of the boundaries episode was, you have data about a person, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. Are you going to do nothing with it and just keep replaying the same dynamic? Or can you take that information and like you said, practice or anticipate a different response? Right. And probably I use this analogy a lot. I don't know if I used it in that episode or not because I don't remember yesterday, but it's sort of like you're driving the same route and you get caught in traffic every time. Then why do you keep driving the same route? I live near the high school in my town. And so people who are routinely late for appointments, they'll say, oh my gosh, I got caught in the high school traffic. And I want to say, yeah, the high school gets out every single day at the exact same time. So what are you doing with that data, right? Are you adjusting your route or are you doing the same thing over and over again? Well, and that's also why they're in your office probably (laughs) trying to unlearn a pattern of repetitive behavior that isn't serving them. (laughs) Right. Instead of catastrophically anticipating, anticipate how your response is going to be different. And you can let yourself have a little fun with that. Why are they like that? Why do they always do that? Forget about those why questions. Not helpful. But you might come up with a response that's kind of fun for you. So maybe you imagine that you're just going to stare at them in silence and not blink 
and see how long it takes for them to say something, right? I mean, that would be more fun. So they come in and they say like, oh, I see you still have that hairstyle or, oh gosh, I've told you to recover your couches. I guess you're not going to do that. Whatever. Work must be busy because I clearly see you're not exercising. (laughs) Oh my God. Oh, that's so harsh. You can even practice with your partner or practice with a friend where you're just going to sit and stare at them and try not to blink. Okay, but I just need to pause for a second. Because if at any point over the Christmas break, I'm hosting and you start staring at me, lady, (laughs) the jig is up. But I'll tell you that if I were to anticipate us being, which we often are together for the holidays, I can truly say, Robin, you have never sent a passive aggressive criticism my way. No, I have not. No. All I'm going to anticipate is that I'm going to get to your house and it's going to be lovely and you're going to be like, hey, come on in and can you mash the potatoes? Yeah. Now I'm just thinking I'm going to walk into your house and you're going to say something and I'm just going to stare at you and not blink. (laughs) No matter what you say. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, I want to bring up a New York Times article that I read to get your take on it. Oh, okay. Fabulous. Imagine for a moment something that looks like a dryer sheet, but it's not. It's a liquidless laundry detergent sheet that dissolves 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. There's no measuring, no mess, no heavy lifting of a big, unrecyclable jug. So you know what we're talking about? We're talking about Earth Breeze. Earth Breeze is an incredible detergent. It works. I say this all the time. I have a very stinky family. And yet they're so lovely. I need a detergent that works well. It is delivered to your door. The packaging is lightweight. It's biodegradable. I have so much space. Every time I do a load of laundry, I still say to myself, why didn't they think of this before? Join over 2 million Americans that are making a difference with Earth Breeze, making a difference in your clean, fresh-smelling laundry, and also making a difference for the environment. If you're still not convinced, they offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't like it, you get a full refund, no questions asked, no return necessary. Trust me, there is no reason not to switch. So right now, our listeners can subscribe to EarthBreeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks to get started. And that's earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks. You know, this holiday season, we think a lot about giving back. And one of the things that I think is challenging for families is finding ways to volunteer that are also age appropriate because a lot of times our kids want to help, but they're often too young to do a lot of the in-person volunteer activities that my area offers. Yeah, I think that's such a common problem. And so here we have Give As We Grow. It's a first-of-its-kind free educational mobile app for children ages 8 to 11 that teaches kids via fun, service-focused mini-game quests to tap into their unique talents and interests to help others. It's like providing a bridge to real-world volunteering, and research shows that in order for generosity to be built for the giving back that happens during childhood, to actually growing into generous adults, giving back must be child-led. So Give As We Grow creates a safe and fun space for kids to do this conveniently. Very cool. Studies show that there is a biological connection between generosity and happiness. I've seen that research. It really serves to create connection, which you know how much I value connection. Children who volunteer do better in school they're less likely to engage in risky behaviors. So we want to raise volunteers. So are you ready to spark a new movement in generosity? Find and download for free Give As We Grow in the App Store for Android and Apple operating system. And for the resources for the whole family, visit giveaswegrow.org. It is definitely the season where people can get sick. But proactively support your family's immune systems and stay ahead of the game with Beekeepers Naturals Propolis Throat Spray and these amazing new Propolis Throat Soothing Lollipops that my son loves. You're telling me that there's a soothing lollipop that we can give our kids? They are delicious. They have a defense providing propolis. They've got vitamin D and zinc and wildflower honey. They can actually love the taste of a beekeeper's natural product and 
we can get what they need into their bodies without battling over something that tastes horrible. They have it in a throat spray that you can always have on hand, but you can include the lollipops inside their lunchbox and they have 50% less sugar. Vitamin D, zinc, wildflower honey. It soothes kids' throats and it supports their immune systems. Today, Beekeepers Naturals is offering you an exclusive offer. So go to beekeepersnaturals.com slash flusterclucks or enter Fluster Clucks and get 20% off your order. That's B-E-E-K-E-E-P-E-R-S-N-A-T-U-R-A-L-S dot com slash Fluster Clucks or enter code Fluster Clucks. Beekeepers Naturals products are also available at Target, Whole Foods, Amazon, CVS, and Walgreens. Okay, we're back. So, Lynn, I think I texted you this article because I thought it was really interesting, talking about the most toxic relationships. And I thought it was so insightful. What the article stated was that the most toxic relationships are often those that are hot and cold. Because in addition to the past patterns that are painful, there are really positive interactions mixed in. So the person never knows, am I about to get beaten over the head or hugged? Mm -hmm. And in my world, we would call that insecure attachment. When we look at the relationship that kids have with parents, when unfortunately there is stuff going on with the parent, the insecure attachment is you never know what you're going to get. And so there's a real conflict because sometimes you feel loving and supported and sometimes you feel demeaned and criticized. So that's a very good type of relationship to bring up because you may have a relative who does that. And so what would be the specific ways that you might want to deal with that? Well, for one, just you stating that, Robin, just you talking about and putting words to that, I think is relieving to some people. There are probably people listening that are saying like, oh my God, that's exactly what it's like with my mother-in-law. Or, oh my gosh, that's exactly how my grandmother treats me. Being aware that you're going to get hit from both sides and we want to normalize the confusion that that causes. And then you want to step back and you want to say, what do I do when I am getting the criticism? And what do I do when I'm getting the love and attention and approval? And pay attention to what your moves are during that. Because one of the things that's helpful is that you can decide how you're going to be with that person consistently in a way that feels genuine or positive to you. When I'm talking to mostly adults who are having difficulty with adult relationships, with people that they want to keep a relationship with, but it's really one of these, just like you described, this ambivalent relationships, I always say, when you step into the situation, here's what I want your mantra to be. Throw some love at it. I was just about to say that. Yep. Throw some love at it because you're not going to be able to out-criticize them, nor do you want to. You go away feeling crappy about yourself. You're not going to be able to soak up all the love and think that that's going to repair or protect you from the next time they throw the criticism at you. That's just not going to happen. So you've just got to be consistent with who you want to be in that interaction. And so if you think, I'm just going to throw some love at it. The other thing that I've had people do is if you have somebody where it's not all that ambivalent, maybe it's an 80-20 ratio of criticism and wounding, and every once in a while they throw you a little nugget of something, I want you to have a mantra in your head and even have a little reminder that you write down on a piece of paper and put in your pocket that you can put your hand in your pocket and touch physically that just reminds you who or what this person is. Perhaps, for example, you have somebody in your life who's just consistently critical. You have a little piece of paper in your pocket that says, you know she's going to be critical. Or wait for the criticism, it's coming and you can handle it. Write yourself a little message, put it in your pocket, and as you're standing there having the interaction with this person, you just put your hand in your pocket and you're playing with that little piece of paper and it just bolsters you so that you don't get sucked into the vortex of taking something personally that's not really about you. That's the key. One of my good friends, her mother's a piece of work, as they say, and she's very critical and very particular. My friend and her husband hosted her 
he poured her a glass of wine and said, yeah, would you like to taste the wine? And she tasted it and said, I don't like that bottle. Which is, of course, like so many people at a restaurant, very rarely would you say like, no, that's not okay, unless the wine had gone bad. So then he said, okay, and he got her another bottle of wine and she refused that one too. And then he got a third bottle? He got a third bottle. And when my friend was telling me this, I think my jaw was on the floor. One of the things I mentioned to her is that the next time they have her over, when you throw love or throw attention so that her husband goes up to her, and of course, this is a little bit of acting, it is so nice to have you back. I have a new wine I'm so excited to share with you. So would you like a glass now? If it's making this woman feel like special in the moment and not so insecure about all the things going on, it may just open the door of a better interaction. Yeah. I like the fact that you're saying better interaction because sometimes that's about as good as we can hope for with some people, right? Absolutely. So when people say, well, I want to do this because I want to have a better relationship Now, I am not saying that we shouldn't work on relationships and talk about things, but at Thanksgiving dinner or at Christmas Eve, if you've got somebody who is consistently showing you a pattern of behavior, that's not the time to address the relationship. Keep your goals small. And the goal may be, I'm just going to see if I can have a positive interaction with this person. I'm going to see what I can do to have a positive interaction. And it might not work. And that's okay, too. Your friend could have that interaction and the woman can say, oh, well, geez, it's got to be better than last time I was here. I mean, swill you served. I mean, oh, I still tell my friends about it. I couldn't believe I came to your house and you served me such terrible wine. Yeah, that wouldn't make it much easier, would it? It wouldn't make it much easier. Yeah. One of the ways to think about this is how are you going to end this interaction with this difficult person on the holidays? How are you going to end it so when they leave your house... You think to yourself, oh, I really manage that pretty well. Like, it's not like you feel happy all the time, but I manage that pretty well. Or I'm proud of the way, I'm pleased with the way that I showed up for myself during this interaction with this difficult person. Keep it about you and your reactions and you feeling good about the way you handled it. That's sometimes the best we can do. One of the other ways to handle this is I really like to gamify this thing. And we've talked about this before. If people are remembering, I gave the example of the mother-in-law who came to visit the woman and she did that passive aggressive sighing. You know, she's like, ah, and that it would drive the daughter-in-law crazy. Recently, a woman came up to me after a talk that I gave when I was out West and she said her mother-in-law was coming to visit. And she said, my mother-in-law is so critical Like she just is always pointing out the things that are wrong in my house or the things that are wrong with me. She'd probably be the kind of mother-in-law that would say like, oh, I bet work is busy because you certainly haven't been exercising. It'd probably be that kind of mother-in-law. The game that you make, the way that you can have fun with this is that you just keep track of all the things that the person says or does that are the predictable pattern. And what I did with this daughter-in-law in in the past, is that you can include the family, you can include your partner, but you're trying to earn points based on how often the person does their behavior. And then you can win a prize at the end of the night or the end of the holiday or the end of the visit. You win a prize based on how many points that you've earned. And it just completely flips your reaction to the behavior. Well, not only does it flip your reaction in the moment, but let's talk about what it also does. It takes that catastrophic anticipatory, oh my God, I'm dreading this, I'm dreading this, I'm dreading this. Instead of reacting to what you know will happen or what you fear will happen, instead you become empowered to say, this is going to happen and this is what I'm going to do when it happens. It's such a great shift. I used to teach spinning, as I've told you guys before, and we always had a class. Like at 5 a.m. too. Yes, at 5 a.m. I stopped. I'm not doing it anymore. But we had a class on Thanksgiving morning. People would come Thanksgiving morning, which was totally fun. And then I would go off to my in-laws for Thanksgiving. And my father-in-law had a series of very predictable behaviors that for a very long time drove me crazy. And so we started a contest in my spinning class People had to predict which of his phrases he was going to say 
And then there was prizes based on whether or not you predicted correctly. So the whole time that I was up there, I just couldn't wait to get back to my spinning class to tell people what had happened. And then there was prizes that were awarded. It made it so much fun for me. Okay. So I know we actually talked about some of his phrases on another episode and I'm trying to recall what they were. So I bet another person listening right now was like, oh yeah, what was it? Tell me. One of the phrases, so he would serve that he would make a beautiful Thanksgiving dinner. He was super controlling about it, but he was a great cook and it was amazing. And then at the end, he would either say, not bad for a little pick me up, which he was like fishing for compliments. I mean, he spent like 12 hours cooking this dinner, not bad for a little pick me up, or he would say, not bad for a beginner. So we would bet which phrase he was going to use. It was just a way for me to amuse myself in a very predictable situation. We had a little bit of a sweeter phrase at my house. My adorable grandfather started every family meal. Anybody who doesn't like this life's crazy. Oh, that's so sweet. See, and I'm glad you're bringing that up because we're talking about like all the ridiculous, horrible, critical things that people say. And it's just good to have a reminder sometimes that there's also traditions that are just so sweet. Yeah, so that's a great phrase. If you're dealing with your own kids and your own family, and maybe you've got some relatives that are toxic, you've got a critical parent, you've got somebody that's been difficult to deal with, is that you think about starting a tradition with your kids at your dinner table where you raise your glass and say something as sweet as that. Wouldn't that be a nice way to sort of counterbalance the criticism? That's right. What I really appreciate marrying into your family is the desire to laugh, the desire to be silly. My family of origin like, was really warm and loving, but it wasn't silly and fun the way your family is. So I just love that. And so we play games and we get together and it's all about play. But last year, we played a joke on a new member of the family <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and pretended that I came from a family with some really questionable practices. <laughs> And that she was going to be inaugurated into the family by participating. I think it was like measuring our feet. Like, what the heck was that? So you're like, we do an annual foot measurement. And like, everyone was in on the joke except for a few people. And like, that was how we started our dinner. Sometimes if you are from a family where there wasn't that kind of play, figure out who around the table you can pull into a joke. Man. Because that is everything. Yeah, I do remember that. It was really funny. She went along with it. She was like, oh, okay, all right, yeah. I think that's a good point that you bring up is that it's playfulness and it's silliness because I think what happens when you're doing this catastrophic anticipation, when you're telling these stories, when you're watching this movie, is that it gets in the way of you, for example, coming up with a great idea that's about connection or silliness or playfulness. So you're spending all your time anticipating what your critical grandmother is going to say or what your uncle is going to do or whether or not your aunt is going to drink too much or whatever. And we get so absorbed in that that we forget that we can also come up with these great traditions and fun things that are about connection and silliness and playfulness and joking. Remember, the person that does what they do, they're going to do what they do. So now is the time for us to talk about the expression that you say in many episodes. This is the biggest game changer for you that Michael Yabko taught you. So say it again for the cheap seats in the back. Okay. There is a big difference between something that impacts you personally and something that you need to take personally. Big difference between those two things. Walk us through those examples. Somebody, for example, might be highly critical and it impacts you because you hear it and it annoys you and you feel that little sting. But when you take it personally, you make it about you. I'll give you a good example. I got this new card. I was so excited for it. And this woman just, I know it's a woman now because they arrested her, which I just found out recently, but it was a hit and run. She just smashed the crap out of my new car. It was parked. I was at the Barbie movie and the car was parked. And it impacted me personally. My car got multiple thousands of dollars of damage. I had to get a rental collar. I had to do all the things that you have to do when your car gets smashed. 
but I didn't need to take it personally. I didn't need to think, why did that woman smash my car? What was it about me and my car that she decided she was going to smash my car? It impacted me personally. I didn't have to take it personally. If somebody has a substance use problem, if somebody drinks too much at your holiday gathering, it may impact you personally, but it is not about you. They didn't show up and decide that they were going to drink too much to ruin your Thanksgiving. That's what they do. Impact versus taking it personally. It is an incredibly helpful frame to put the behavior of other people into when you're dealing with people that are difficult. Remember that this is just a pattern and to not feel like it's so, so personal. Right. Nor is it up to you to fix it. And one of the things that I think is kind of a myth or a fallacy about these patterns is the idea that when somebody does their pattern, you have to confront them about it. We have to work this out. We have to work this through. We have to figure this out. You do not have to do that. You can absolutely make it a game. You can absolutely talk about it to somebody later. You can absolutely let it go. It is not up to you in that moment or ever, honestly, to fix that pattern. That's not on you. If that's what they're going to do, it is totally okay for you to create that distance, to create that buffer where that pattern of theirs is not about you. I say this all the time, easier said than done. People say that to me that all the time. Easier said than done, Lynn. I'm like, yeah, no shit. Easier said than done, but it is okay for you to not address the pattern. Absolutely. So I know there's a lot of talk right now coming out about mental health and parents really are worried about their kids. One of the things we know is that very often people wait a long time before they seek help for themselves or their kids. In fact, parents on average wait anywhere from two to eight years before they get help for their child who's dealing with anxiety. Okay, so look, you can get a therapist through Talkspace. You don't have to wait. You know how much we talk about developing skills and tools to be able to manage your emotions, and Talkspace makes it easy and affordable. Yeah, it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions with your licensed therapist from the comfort of your home. There's no need to commute to appointments, you don't miss time at work, or you don't have to line up childcare in order to attend sessions. So it's really mental health care made easy. It's secure, it's private, it's affordable, it's in network with most major insurers. So there's really no reason why you need to put off getting the help you need for things like anxiety, depression. There's a lot going on in the world right now, and sometimes it just is really helpful to get the support you need from a licensed professional. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to get $80 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com slash Fluster. Hey, everybody. This is Robin at Fluster Clocks. When Lynn and I are not having a great time recording our podcast on the weekends, I have a day job. I have a travel magazine for families. So if you're thinking about a 2023 family vacation, don't plan anything without reading our guides to the best Disney hotels, the best way to get a Disney guide for less, and everything you need to know about booking a Disney cruise. Lux Recess has been since 2014 the go-to place for parents to read about luxury travel with honest reviews written for parents by parents. Check it out. The links are in the show notes for our best guides to Florida travel for your spring break in 2023. That's LuxRecess.com. L-U-X-C-R-E-C-E-S-S.com. Okay, so now back to the show. So Lynn, I want to talk to you about something, I guess, both a little darker, but also about self-love too, because sometimes it is appropriate to say, you know what? No more. I don't think I should be with this family member because of past abuse, because of really inappropriate behavior or whatever that is. How does one make those decisions and choices in a way that you think is appropriate and healthy? 
there are some people in your life that you want to have no contact with. Some people who have been abusive, that you've given them maybe a gazillion chances, you know that it's not going to end well, and you don't have to put yourself through that. So there are some people where it is truly, we have nothing to do with that person. We have somebody in my husband's family where that was the criteria. We decided very early on in my children's lives that this person was not going to be around my children because of her behavior. So that's a pretty dramatic thing to do, but it is appropriate sometimes. Though more often, you're going to have contact with this person or you wanted to maintain some relationship with them. I think one of the things to think about is that when you have contact with that person, everything that I've already said applies. And in addition, you can manage the contact in a way where it is up to you the length of it say you've got a really difficult relative, you wouldn't want to invite that relative to your Christmas Day open house because then you don't have control about when they come and when they go and you're hostessing and it's too much for you to handle. But you might say, I'd love to come and meet you for coffee on Christmas Eve morning so that we can catch up. And you set a time, so you put boundaries around it, you put limits around the contact that you have with them. So as you're thinking about engaging with these people, ask yourself this question, will I have enough control or management about the arrival and the departure? And if you don't, and if this feels too risky for you, and if they have the capacity to come in and really make a mess of something that's important to you, then it is okay for you not to include them. And then you may decide that you're going to have contact with them at another time. The other thing too is I know that a lot of people come from blended families where they've got different sets of parents. Even if you're in a marriage and you've got in-laws and you've got other parents, one of the mistakes that people make is they try and smush too much into one day. And then our level of irritation and our level of tolerance of these patterns is going to go down with every hour that passes. And then also your kids are going to be fried and it's not going to end well. Really limit your contact with people on those days. You do not have to shove it all onto one day and you do not have to see people that truly are not healthy people in your lives to the extreme. How can I control the arrival and the departure? And if you can't, then consider doing it at another time. Right. I mean, you and I, we've navigated these tricky situations, usually because addiction is involved. Yeah. Yeah. That's very often the case. Yeah. And that's so common with a lot of families. So if you think this is just your family, it's not. A lot of us deal with that. Addiction has created landmines where we're always trying to manage. How do we still celebrate in a way that we feel like it's good for our kids, it's good for us? I like that. How can you get in and get out when you need to? And the other thing too, because you bring up addiction, and I think this is something that when you're hosting, you should feel more empowered to do. If addiction is an issue in your family and you know you have people that struggle with it, it is perfectly fine for you to not serve alcohol at holiday gatherings and to let the people know that for whatever reason, you can make up whatever you want. You don't have to be truthful about it, but it is okay for you to minimize the risk that somebody's drinking is going to ruin what should be a wonderful occasion for your family. It is okay to say this is going to be a non-alcoholic event. I'm not saying that you will be able to prevent the person from drinking. Right. So what happens sometimes is that that family member will choose not to attend. I didn't mean to say that if you tell your alcoholic uncle there's no alcohol, he's going to have a sober Christmas, right? It doesn't work that <laughs> it way. Doesn't work it doesn't, but it does send a message and it sets a boundary. So that if that person is not interested in attending, then they can make that choice. They'll be angry at you, but you don't have to serve alcohol to an alcoholic in your home if you know that it's going to end badly, which oftentimes it does. You're allowed to set that boundary. You're allowed to say that that's not going to happen. The other thing, too, is that it's a really good message to your kids that you can have a holiday gathering and it doesn't have to be working around Uncle Joe's alcoholism. I've been at many a gathering where the person's addiction caused a problem. 
I have strong feelings about this because we did that whole episode on the mommy wine culture. Go back and listen to that. But it really is okay and really is important for your kids to get the message. You shouldn't base your holidays around alcohol is what I'm saying. And you don't have to base your holidays around alcohol if addiction is a problem in your family. Right. And you will face backlash from that family, but maybe that's okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the hard part is that when you set boundaries, you get backlash, people. I was just imagining, Robin, that you were talking about, you know, you have the one family member who does this and the one family member who does that, is that everybody has a t-shirt sitting around the family table. I'm sure there's a New Yorker cartoon, passive aggressive, unpredictably rageful, drinks too much, you know, whatever it is. Well, what if we created a game that was kind of like a variation of a murder mystery dinner party where everyone was given set patterns and had to act them out? Yeah. Uncle Joe with the whiskey in the kitchen. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) If you're listening to this and you have young kids and you're sort of trying to come up with your family traditions, is that it really is okay for you to really pay attention to what works for you and your family. And as always, when we set boundaries, there is backlash, but throw some love at it, inject some silliness, have some play, and you can really have wonderful holidays without all of this catastrophic pressure that we put on ourselves. Thanks for listening. And if you found this podcast helpful, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this information. And if you'd like to dig deeper on any of these topics, we have specialized playlists on our Spotify profile and the link is in the show notes. Topics like teens, depression, and OCD. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Robin. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark-Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast.